even got a hug. That's a cool thing when you get a hug. No, I don't want a hug. I don't hug. Hey, on your chairs, uh, in front of your chairs, actually, on the front row, you, you see this sitting on your chair. And in, in front of your chairs, in those little pockets, are, is this little card looks like this. simply says, Unleashed Your Gifts. And I encourage you to grab that, pull it out. We're going to talk about that uh, this morning as things go along. We talked a little bit about it last week. Eric did a really great job last week opening up this series called Unleashed. And um, as he was sitting down, uh, as I was sitting, in, I, had, I, I had to, I had to. I had to sit in the six o'clock uh, in the Friday night service, and then I had to sit or the Saturday night service. I had to sit in the eleven o'clock service with my kids, so I had to listen to the message twice. No, I was privileged to listen to the message twice. And so, as I was uh, as I was listening to him uh, share out Ephesians two ten that um, you know God has created within us that God has made you a workmanship in Jesus Christ, and the importance of you owning on to that. I started reading through Ephesians in, in the midst of one of those services, and as I was reading through Ephesians, actually what I was thinking to myself was, what am I going to talk about next week? Uh, you know, they, I, I get this, uh, they sat down with me and said, Here, here's, what, here's where we want to go with this series, and here's what we want you to hit on, and, and I need to tell you that these past couple weeks have been very, very uh, challenging for me, and, and so I was sitting there last week going, so what, what am I, I going to go with la- next week? And so as I was reading through Ephesians, just the first part of Ephesians, there was a word that stuck out to me that I thought, this is it, and here's the word. It's just simply the word us. That when you read through Ephesians, that word us or you or, you know, it's all, it's all meant not necessarily for me. You know, I know that I'm a workmanship, that I'm a, a work of God, more or less, and, and yet I also know that, that Paul is saying to the church in Ephesus, listen, you need to understand that you are a workmanship of God. It's you. And uh, that when it comes to the church, it's about us. And it's about what we are going to do together and how we are going to work together to accomplish all that God wants to accomplish in us and through us. And when it comes to this issue of our independence, there's very little that we really do on our own. I mean, think about it. Relationships, you really, you've got to do relationships together. When you talk about marriage, you, you do the relationship together. When you talk about parenting, you, you, you need help in, in the element of parenting, whether uh, your mom and dad there in the house or like me, I've, got a, I've now got to engage others in helping me with my parenting because sometimes my kids just stress me out is what they do. Um, you know, as a church, we do it as a team. We do it as a team. I, I, was, I was thinking about just some of the things that go on around here that are really, really team focused. A lot of people don't realize how the team works together. When you, when you drive out uh, this back lot uh, on the weekends, you notice that little garden that's out there. And it doesn't look like a huge patch of ground that's out there. We call it the 5-2 garden. It, it came because uh, someone a number of years ago had a, had a vision to, to do this garden and to give those vegetables and everything else away. And, you know, last year we gave away, we gave away 3,000 pounds of veggies and stuff that came out of that garden. And, and this year we're going to be partnering with Harvester Church down in the inner city and because one of the, one of the needs they have in their, in their food, in their distribution kitchen is, is fresh vegetables and, uh, because that's a need in the community and in the, in the inner, inner city. And we said, hey, we can partner with that. And so as you think about your role in that, you know, 5-2 is coming up this year. Maybe that would be a part of partnership for you. Uh, this afternoon, they're going to tear this place apart, and, uh, and the True Vine garage sale is going to kick in, and you have given your stuff. And it's amazing to me how much stuff you accumulate year after year after year. But I get it. Trust me, I get it. And it's going to come in, and there's going to be a lot of people here tearing this place down and, and putting all the, you know, pulling stuff out of those trucks and bringing it here and and, uh, and then the proceeds of that sale go like to the Browns, who are in China right now. And the deal on the Browns is, is that their, their, adoption, uh, their adoption actually was moved up because of the condition, the health condition of that little girl they're going to be adopting. And uh, she's in, in, she needs medical attention as quick as she can get that medical attention. And so they said, hey, we believe God's called us to her. We believe that this is God's calling on our life. And we're going to go get her and we're going to bring her home. And, and part of the proceeds that went to True Vine helped in a significant matching grant for them that uh, allowed them to, to reduce the cost of this. And all, you know, within a matter of, of just a couple months, all their expenses, when I, when I talked to them last week, and they said, hey, we're heading out, I said, tell me where you're at financially. And they said, all is cared for. All is cared for. And that's a, that's a gift of God and a gift of people coming together and making that thing happen. And, and so, you know, the garage sale's going on. I just need to tell you this, and, and that is that uh, we got everybody working this thing to, to make it happen today, but they are in, des- they're in, they're in need of folks who would say, you know what, I can give up time Friday night, I can give up time on Saturday or even Saturday afternoon to come and actually work the sale. And the great thing about the sale is the True Vine team has looked at this sale, is they've looked at this, they said, this is not just about moving stuff out of the church so that we can raise some dollars for, for adoption. They've looked at it, they said, no, this is an opportunity where people are going to come into our church who wouldn't normally come into our church. And we get the opportunity to rub shoulders with them 
and to talk with them and to smile with them and to engage with them. And, and I just need to tell you, it's a, it's a tremendous opportunity. And so as you leave this morning, uh, and if you can help on Friday night and Saturday, give us some time. Sunday, Saturday afternoon is really important because we've got to get everything out so that we can kind of make church happen next weekend. Make sure you stop by the True Vine table on your way out and, and make that deal happen. Because the fact is that, that we can't do it alone. We can't do it on our own. Uh, last fall, uh, Dawson uh, wanted to go see Adele. Anybody ever seen Adele in concert? Uh, maybe, maybe some of you will not think of me very well after this. But, um, so I said, well, let's, go, let's go do it. So we, we got Adele tickets like four days before the concert. We, we got Adele tickets 10 rows from the stage. I could see her sweat. And, uh, and you know, I, we got them from the box office, actually. A little inside information there for you. And uh, so we're sitting there, and, and, uh, and I, I didn't know much about Adele. And I'm sitting there watching thousands of people sing Adele, sing Adele sad songs for the entire concert. I'm sitting there, I'm thinking to myself, man, now that she's getting married, I hope she comes up with some happy songs because she needs some happy songs. This is depressing is what this is. But as, I, as I'm watching the concert unfold, the thing that was really cool for me was uh, not only what was going on, but the light. You know, when I go to a concert, I love, you know, even last weekend at the Jesus Culture concert, I did the same thing, kind of watched it from the top, looking down. I love to see the lights work. I, I love to hear, hear the music, and I love to see an orchestra kick in. And there's just something, isn't there, about seeing all those pieces come together and making the whole deal happen. And you go walk away, and it's just not just simply about hearing one person sing. It's about seeing it all work together as one. It's kind of a cool, beautiful experience. Well, the church is supposed to work the very same way. We're supposed to work together to create this, this music that God longs for us to be singing to the world around us that, that desperately wants to, to have a little bit of hope, and that hope we know comes through Christ Jesus and Jesus himself. And so the big idea for you this morning is simply this, and that is that the influence of a church is unleashed when its people work together as one. The influence of a church is unleashed when its people work together as one. And Paul talks about this. I'm going to tell you four ways, four ones that Paul gives to us. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 4, if you have your Bibles, turn to Ephesians 4, and we're going to look at the first 13 verses. And this is the first thing that Paul tells us to do, and that is that as a church, you need to operate with one heart. You need to have one heart. Look at verses 1 and 2 of chapter 4. He says, As a prisoner of the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Let's read this out loud together. Be completely humble gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. You know, it's kind of, we talked about the fruit of the Spirit at the beginning of the year, kind of comes back our way, even as it relates to our conduct within the, the confines of the church. He says, listen, when, when it comes to, to operating together, when it comes to working together, when it comes to making this organism called the church alive and, and active and, and vibrant and, and unleashed, you need to make sure that, that you demonstrate this issue of humility and gentleness and patience and that of being loving, that you need to show, you need to be humble and gentle and patient and loving. And that word humble really means, it just simply means this, it means the humble, it means the humble recognition of the worth and the value of other people, that you see value in each other, that you see value in what the others bring to the table and that you value that, whether, whether it be a gift like a Jen a few moments ago that used her gift to lead us in that song, did a fantastic job leading us in that song and and, and it comes from the tips of her toes all the way out. I know it does because I know her story and, and how she has just really held on to that beautiful name of Jesus. And when you, when you see that gift being used, it moves you and it motivates you. As much as it is the person that, that handed you a cup of coffee this morning when you walked in, they handed it to you with a smile. And uh, you're encouraged that you got a cup of coffee. And they're encouraged that you got a cup of coffee because when they look at your face, they're thinking, you need a cup of coffee right now. You know, and so, you know, that all works together as well. But there's an importance of just showing humility. You know, pride, interesting, pride lurks behind all discord. Anytime there's discord in a church, it's because someone's pride got in the way. Let me tell you this. Humility produces unity. Humility produces unity. And he says, and make sure that you show yourself to be gentle. In other words, strength under control. And really what that means is that I am not going to assert my rights. That there are times when I'm going to be willing to step back for the, for the sake of the body, and I'm going to say, man, this is not, you know, I know what I want, but I'm not going to assert my rights on that one. I'm going to, I'm going to set my rights aside on that one, and, and I'm, going to, I'm going to listen, and I'm going to engage, and maybe I'm going to engage quietly. Maybe, maybe I'm not fully all in on this one, but I'm a part of this body because I'm a part of this body. I'm not going to... I'm not going to use sidebar conversations to create disunity and to create conflict. I'm going to keep my thoughts maybe to myself, maybe talk to a leader, whatever it may be, and say, I don't agree, but, but I'm here. I'm committed. It's amazing how that gentleness comes into play. Your patience. 
It means long-suffering towards aggravating people. Anybody got any aggravating people in your life? Maybe they're sitting right next to you right now. Um, you know, we, we all do. <laughs> I do, trust me. Uh, you know, yeah, aggravating people in your life, and you just you demonstrate the sense of being, of being patient with them and certainly loving, because love keeps all things together. It just, it just brings it all together. It brings it all together. And, and what we need to understand is that the church is made up of a lot of different kinds of people. And I just need to tell you this, and that is that when it comes to church, church is made up of people. And, and as John Ortberg said so well, everybody's normal until you get to know them. <laughs> None of you are normal, and neither am I. And we bring that into play, and that can create some interesting moments along the way. I remember when I was in Michigan, first church I ever was a, was a part of as a staff member, and I went to this, uh, this church, about 250 people up in Wald Lake, Michigan, and, and uh, a great pastor that was there uh, leading the charge, and, um, and, uh, and, and so uh, I was there like two or three weeks, and, and John went on vacation. He said, I'm leaving for vacation a couple weeks, and you're going to be in charge, and, and, and I was okay with that. And he said, so you're going to speak Saturday, Sunday morning? And, uh, and then, you know, Sunday night, we did Sunday night services. I'm so thankful we don't do Sunday night services. But we did Sunday night services there. And, and at that church, they always had testimony time on Sunday night service when people would get up and share their story. He said, now listen, I'm going to tell you this right now. He said, you've you got to take that deal on on Sunday night. He said, Harry's going to be there. And he said, I'm tell you what Harry's going to do. Because I'm not there, and you're there, and it's your first time being there. Harry's going to ask for the mic. Don't give him the mic. I said, okay. And so uh, we got there, and sure enough, you know, let's, you know, what's the Lord doing in your life? And Harry stood up. Harry was an older guy, uh, came to know the Lord later in life, um, just a really strong kind of guy, just a ni- nice guy, but a real strong kind of guy. And he walked up to the front. He walked right up the front. I'm holding the mic. He said, Pastor, can I have the mic? Well, I'm a people pleaser. So I said, <laughs> Okay, Harry. So I handed him the mic. That was the one thing I should have never done at that point because Harry took off. And I mean, he was way pacing the front of that church and, and uh, he was telling his story and he was telling what the Lord was doing in his life. And you know, the volume was increasing as it was going on. And I'm sitting there going, oh, this is not good. This is not good. And then he got done. I don't know how long it took, but he got done. And, and John showed up after vacation. He said, so how'd Sunday night go? I said, well, Harry got the mic. I told you not to give him the mic. You know, but the thing about Harry is that Harry taught me a lot of things. Harry, is, Harry eventually died, and, uh, and, and just really, he was a guy that just deeply loved the Lord, uh, and uh, he had that, that side of him, but, but, but Harry taught me what it meant to be humble, and to have a humble recognition of worth and value for other people. He taught me that, you know what, sometimes I don't need to assert my rights, but it's okay, Harry, share your story. Patient, I need to be long-suffering towards some aggravating people in my life, and loving, knowing that it'll keep it all together. He's, Paul says, listen, as a church, you need to make certain that if you're going to really have this influence, uh, you need to have one heart, one heart. And then he says, and then you need to focus on one God, one God. This is really, this, this, this section of scripture is, a, is an incredible section of scripture. You need to take some time this next week and read it. This is what Paul says. He says, make every effort, verses three through six, make every effort Make every effort, and if you underline your Bibles, underline that phrase, every effort, to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is over all, and through all, and in all. Anybody want to guess what the key word is in that, in that section of Scripture? What is it? It's not all. How can it be all? What, what's the big idea? The big idea is the influence of a church is unleashed when its people work together as one. Come on, people. Good grief. God, take you back to, to kindergarten? I mean, come on. Yeah, it's, it's one is what it is. It's one. One Lord. One Lord. And, and, and what's really interesting about this passage is how the ones line up. I mean, this is really cool. One is he says, listen, we're one body. And that one body is the result of one spirit. If you remember in, Acts, in, in the book of Acts, when, 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 when Christ is ascended and the, and the people, those, those disciples were together in that upper room, and the Holy Spirit came in and came on, came on them and, and uh, indwelled among them and within them, that was the launching of this church is what it was. It was the launching of not many bodies, but it was the launching of one body called the church. And the Spirit of God draws us all together as one. 
The Spirit of God is in you as a Christ follower. The Spirit of God is leading you. And the Spirit of God, his presence is right here, right now. And then he says, and there's one hope. He says there's one hope, and there's one, one faith, and there's, there's one baptism. And, and that is a result of, of one Lord, of what Christ did for us upon the cross. That, that really the cross keeps us focused on, on one mission and what we're about as a church. And, and we don't have to get sidetracked on other things and misaligned on other things. It, it's about what Christ did on that cross. And, and what Christ did on that cross, that atoning sacrifice for our sins, that when we accept Christ our Savior, we become a part of that one body because of one Lord the one spirit bringing us together. And then he says, and you are part of not only one body and one hope, but you're part of one family, which he talks about one father, one God and father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Anybody want to guess what the key word is in that little phrase is? <laughs> all, yeah. Um, you know, and so it's, it's the word father. It's the word father. So in other words, you know, we're, we're just kind of, we're all brothers and sisters of a different mother is what we are, you know? Saturday night didn't get that either, but I thought you would this morning, so I'm not going to use that 11 o'clock at all. It doesn't sound right, I know. But uh, the fact is that we are all part, we all, we all share the same father. You know, we're adopted into the same family. And I know that what that means is that when you're in a family, families work together, sometimes families fight together, families work hard with each other, families grow with one another, families join arms with each other. He says, man, don't miss sight of that. Don't miss sight of that. And this is what he says. He says, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. What that phrase really means, if we really kind of translate it this way, he would say, be eager to maintain the unity. Spare no effort. Spare no effort. You know, um, what the enemy, we do have an enemy, uh, what the enemy wants to do is the enemy wants to destroy anything that God has created. When you look from Genesis all the way through, God in, in Genesis created this world with order, with order. God created uh, the institution of marriage with order. God created the church, and when the church came into fruition, it was with order. God is not a God of disorder. God is God of order. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, working together in unity. God of order. And what he says to us is that, listen, the one thing that the enemy longs to do is to, to bring about conflict and disruption within the context of a local body of believers to bring about disorder and discard and division and separation. This is such an important, it's important piece for us. Because the fact is that most churches just don't do this very well. As a matter of fact, this fall, for six weeks, six or seven weeks, we're going to spend time together, Sunday morning, uh, weekend services, in these services, and then within the context of small groups, and we're going to spend six to seven weeks together really talking about how do you do uh, relational reconciliation in a biblical way. Does anybody have any relational conflict at all in your life? <laughs> am I the only one? Am I it? I mean, am I, am I it? Do the rest of you have it too? Uh, if you don't have relational conflict, you just don't talk to anybody. So, you know, I mean, it's a, you, you, you've got to have, I mean, you're, you're around people, you're going to have some relational conflict. Well, there's going to be relational conflict in the context of a body, of believers. How do we do that in a way that brings honor to God, that keeps us together as one? The influence of a church is unleashed when its people work together as one. One heart, say that with me, one heart. One heart, one God. Yeah, one heart, one God. And then he says one body, one body. Look at verses 7 through 12. He says, but eat to each one of us, grace has been given us as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts. Just underline that phrase, gave gifts. The word gifts, is this, it comes from the same word as grace. Keros is grace. Charisma is gifts. Same word. It's a gift of grace. He says, and when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. Then verse 11, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers to equip his body, his people for the works of service so the body of Christ may be built up. A lot of times we, when we focus on gifts, and when you hear a, a teaching on gifts, typically the gifts are talking about 
uh, the gifts that the Spirit of God places upon people, and, and we go through the list that's found out of Romans 12, and the list that's found out of 1 Corinthians 12, and you need to know that that is not an exhaustive list. I, I, I really believe this, that, that that's just a, that's a, small, it's a small list of, of, of many gifts and talents and abilities that God has given, but we lose sight of all the other gifts that the Spirit of God has given to us, too, that, 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 that God has given to us. You know, think about this. You have the, the gift of your salvation, I mean, that is a gift. It's a gift from God, your salvation. The Holy Spirit is a gift. Jesus even said in John 14, I'm going to leave, but there's going to be another that's going to come, the comforter, uh, the one who's just like me, and it's a gift is what it is. He is a gift, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Your state in life is a gift. Think about this. You, you, uh, you know, your state in life, whether... Um, you know, as a, you know, for me now, you know, my state of life has changed a little bit since last July. You know, I, I'm taking on a new role of, of being a, a single man and being a single dad and, and having to, to wrestle through the demands and challenges that come that way, and it's, it's shifting, and, and, and I have to realize, okay, God, this is, this is what you called me to right now, and I need to, I need to, to, to do what I can to, to honor you in the midst of this moment, and this is, a, this is a, an element of a calling, and a gift that you've given to me to, to be the best that I can be and do the best that I can do, and, and I'm going to move in that, in that situation. For some of you, you know, the, the state of your, within the context of your relationships or your home or your marriage or your work, you know, I, I talk to a lot of, like, especially younger, you know, uh, young adults or teenagers, and they're going, man, I'm trying to figure out God's calling in my life and, and where God's leading me, where he wants me. I don't want to miss it. I don't want to miss it, you know, and, and I'm sitting there and I just tell them, listen, just, you know what? Who are you right now? What are you doing right now? Right now, I'm a student. Okay, then be the best student you can be right now. Live out your calling as a Christ follower where you're at right now. Don't get so consumed with, God, what, you know, what, what is the, I know it's a mysterious calling God has. No, no, just be, be who you are right now. Be the best parent you can be right now. Be the best spouse you can be right now. Be, be the best lawyer you can be right now. Be the best doctor you can be right now. You know, be the best realtor you can be right now. Be, be the best person who puts together cars that you can be right now. I don't care what it is, but use that as well as a calling that God has placed on you. Your state in life is a gift. That's a gift from you, your ministry. The ministry that you have is a, is a gift. I hope that you, you know, maybe you look at your work as ministry. We'll talk about that next week because we, we all have something in common as it relates to our work. And many times we want to we um, set aside the, the work in the church with the work that you have 40 hours a week. And the fact is that God's called you to that work as well to use those gifts and talents and abilities he's given to you. And you can do that in a very God-honoring way. We're going to talk about that next week. And for many, that's the scope of their ministry. They look at that and they say, man, this is a part of my ministry. I mean, come on, you, you serve as a section leader, but through the rest of the week, you're fixing people's teeth. And, and I know that as you fix people's teeth, it's part of your minute, it's part of who you are. You want to be the best you could be on that. And, and it's true. It's so true. We're going to talk about that next week, but your ministry is so important. When, you, when you're in the midst of your ministry, you find a sense of fulfillment in what you do when you discover that ministry. Tremendous fulfillment. Um, Friday was an interesting day for me. It started at 6 a.m. With a, with a board meeting, and, um, and the whole day was a, was a day of intense conflict. Even on Thursday, I was wrestling through lots of stuff going on Thursday. A um, little insight for you, and that is that um, I have to have my outlines in by Thursday at noon so you can have them printed off so you can fill in the little blanks. And uh, at a quarter till 12 on Thursday, I had nothing. And I'm going, oh, and I don't like to turn in a... I don't like to give you a blank outline. I just feel pressure. Pressure. You all put pressure on me is what you do. <laughs> you know, and so uh, um, I'm sitting there and I'm just, oh, come on, I got to get this, I got to get this. And within 15 minutes, man, I had my, 15 minutes, I just prayed. I sat with Eric. I said, man, help me out on this big idea. We got the big idea put together and bam, 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 came the rest of it. And then came the work. <laughs> Doesn't get, I wish it would come that easy. Then came the work. And, uh, and so that was, Thursday was hard. Friday was hard. And and so uh, Friday, I had some meetings downtown, and, and uh, prior to that, I had um, I have some, some folks here at Pathway, her, her dad was dying, and um, they've only been around PCC for just a few months, and I've connected with them, and, and uh, they actually, when they moved from, uh, from Indianapolis to Fort Wayne, uh, they convinced Lynn's parents to move from Florida to come up to Fort Wayne so, so her and Steve could take care of them right here. And so about six weeks ago, they moved up here, and... Um, and her dad was diagnosed with cancer and very fast moving, very providential they're here. And so this week, um, her dad had to make 
some life changing, some life ending decisions is what he had to make. And so I went up. I had not met them before. I met, you know, obviously Steve and Lynn, but I'd never met her parents. And I walk in the room, and he's on a vent, and I walk in, and he just kind of smiles. And his name is Gene. His wife na- wife's name is Gene. So the girls say, we came from a pair of jeans. <laughs> it's, true. it's true. You would like that joke. You, that's a corny joke that you would like. You would tell that joke to me. Um, anyway, he's got a gift of that, so uh, odd jokes. Um, so anyway, uh, so we're sitting there, and uh, actually, funny thing how they met. I, I've got plenty of time this morning, so I'm just going to keep on going. Um, I, 65 years of marriage together, 65 years. I mean, it's huge, you know, and, and don't ever tell someone, don't ever tell someone who lost their spouse after 65 years, don't ever tell them when you're in that line, man, at least you had 65 great years. Because I'll tell you what, I know what it feels like to lose someone after 22 years. I can't imagine the pain of what it's like to lose someone after 65 years. There's pain. And so uh, she, I said, how'd you guys meet? She said, well, it's a funny thing. We worked in the same building, and, and we were young, and, and we got called down to the, to the computer room. Somebody got called, uh, Gene, I, over the announcement, Gene, we need you in the computer room. So she said, I went to the computer room, and she said, there's another guy sitting there, and the guy that called looked at me and said, what are you doing here? She said, well, you called for Gene to come to the computer room. She, he said, no, I, I didn't call for you. I called for him, and she looked over and saw him, and she went, hmm, he's good looking. <laughs> that was the beginning of a relationship, so the two genes came together. And, uh, and so anyway, uh, so making those decisions, and, and then he made his decision. And so on Friday, I got done with all my stuff and about, you know, I was going to had to head over to, to, to a tennis match with the Lydia's involved in, and I thought, I could, I've got about an hour here. So I left downtown from a meeting, and I, I buzzed up to Parkview, and uh, I don't normally do, hosp- I don't do a lot of hospital visits, because I'm not really good at it. And uh, so I walked in, I walked in the hospital room, and I walked in, and um, I was there for like the last five minutes of his life, and we just prayed him on, you know. Just a powerful moment. Just a precious moment. God's perfect timing in all that. I spent about 40 minutes with him. I left there, and I headed over to pediatrics. And uh, I walked up to a room, and there was one of our young teenagers laying in bed. Her mom was laying next to her. A lot of tears going on. And I walked into that room, and I sat down next to that bed, and we just had just a wonderful time together talking about what was going on and praying and having some laughs and gaining some peace and left there and walked out. And as I was walking out, it was like, I walked out thinking, oh, man, I needed that as much for me as for anybody. But there was a sense when I walked out going, man, God, thank you. There's great joy in serving in this capacity. When you are finding your ministry, you find great joy in that. Great joy in that. You need, to, you need to figure that out. I don't care if it's your work or if it's a place here. Figure it out because you'll find great joy as you look at your life through the lens of how God has gifted you a ministry. Let me tell you the next one, and that is the gift, the gift of you in the body. You are a gift to this body. You need to know that. You are a gift. Matter of fact, you can say this next line. Say this out loud. Here we go. I am a gift. Say it. You've been wanting to say that anyway. I am a gift. You know, and, and the truth is some people find themselves focusing on finding the gift, but I appreciate what one commentator said. He said, we would do well to have less concern about identifying the gifts and more concern about being a gift the Spirit uses to strengthen the body through us. You get caught, I can you find my gift. Just be the gift. Be the gift. Matter of fact, in verse 16 of chapter 4, Paul says, from him... Christ, the whole body joined, t- joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its part, does its work. The ligament, holding it all together. You know, life's a team sport. I mean, you look at dog sledding, dog sledding is a team sport. You look at rowing, rowing's a team sport. You look at football, uh, football's a team sport. I mean, just, just kind of, you keep thinking about it all the way to church. It's a team sport. We are important to each other, and we need each other. We need each other in so many different ways. I have a, a couple men that every other week we get together, and, 
and we spend time learning together and growing together, and uh, we hold each other accountable. They ask me some hard questions. Sat Friday morning, the elder team, we met together, asked me some hard questions. You know, and these men have done a tremendous job of leading and guiding over the, you know, just they, of, of helping us with the vision and the mission and direction we're going. As a matter of fact, in May, we're going to be, we've got a couple elders stepping off this year because of rotation, and so there's going to be opportunity for, for elder nomination from within this body, and, and uh, we'll talk more about that at the beginning of May. But some of you, some of you need to really begin to pray and say, God, maybe this could be something you could be calling me to. Or who, God, who are you calling to this? It's an important role. But the fact is that we need each other. We need each other because through the body, those needs are met from one another. And in fact, Paul, a famous verse that a lot of us hold on to is Philippians 4.19. And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. And you know what we do with that is, is we, we personalize that, don't we? we? We say, and my God will meet all my needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. And, and Paul's saying he's going to meet all your needs. And what's interesting about this verse is when you put it within context and you look at verse, 13, uh, verse 16 all the way down, what Paul is saying to the Ephesians is he says this to them. He says, listen, when I had a need, you as a church met the need. When I had a need, you stepped in and you played a part in meeting that need. And what he's saying was this, and he said, because of what you did, because of what you did, God used you to meet my need. This morning, I got a text before I left the, this morning, sitting up, getting on, a young couple in our church just said, you need to pray for us right now. And in the midst of that, I knew an opportunity to come alongside and encourage to be a part of God meeting a need. I mean, God uses the church to meet those needs together. Collectively, we do that together. We work together to meet needs. And when you think about what we're doing with Beyond, uh, it's about us coming together financially to meet the needs of Beyond. If you look at what we've done with, with already uh, making certain that our, what we're doing in our, in our general operating, our, in our in our in our day-to-day deals are done, and then also comes the issue of, of what we're doing with the build, and we're about a, a million and a half short at this point of actually being able to put a bucket in the ground. The elders said, hey, when we hit three million, we'll get, a, we'll get this deal going and we'll start moving on this thing. And we're just really believing that by the end of May, we can begin to see that needle kind of jump up a little bit. And we're having some good conversations with some folks. But some of you, maybe you've never been a part of this deal and you're going, maybe we need to give this a little more serious thought. Stop by Guest Central on the way out and just pick up a Beyond pamphlet and, and give somebody, give us, give, give us a call and we'll get you in touch with one of the team members just to talk more about that. But, but we really believe that this is important to where we're heading as a church. And then the ministries around here, when you, when you uh, came in, I asked you to pull this out. You know, as we look ahead towards this next year, we realize when you look around here, this space is probably about 85% full. At 11 o'clock, this space is, is full, as well as the venue is, is getting there too. And we realize when we go into the fall, what are we going to do? And one of, the, one of the things we're looking to do is probably pop a third Sunday morning service this fall. And, uh, and begin to look towards that. But as we look towards the fall, we often re- look at this and we realize, man, we need people to begin to look for ways in which they can serve in ministry. And the best way in which you understand your gifts and your abilities is you just begin serving, kind of knock it around for a little bit. And, uh, and there are three, there are, there are really uh, four areas there that are pretty, pretty great opportunities. Kid City provides a lot of opportunities for you to just to begin to engage. Maybe you have a heart for kids. Get involved in Kid City. They can give you some simple ways to serve, some more significant ways to serve, and, and uh, just beginning to engage that way. They would love to talk to you about that. Maybe VBS is a place where you get your feet wet on serving Kid City. It's a, it's a great week. I've had to plan my vacations around VBS this year because my kids are like, we're well, doing VBS, Dad. Okay, that's fine. Um, student ministries, I mean, high school students, I mean, opportunity to engage with these high school students and in very key moments within their life and as it relates to where they're heading in their life. I mean, some of you, you could do that. You could, you could invest in the life of a, of a high school student, come alongside of them and make an impact in their life. I know that for me as a dad in the situation we're in, those leaders have come around my kids. Man, I'm so thankful that I've got people that have come around them in, in light of, of our situation and can, can invest in them and speak to them. And maybe first impressions, you know, maybe the idea that you, you actually do like people and, and, uh, and, and you do enjoy saying hello to people and you can greet or maybe usher or be on the coffee team or the parking team or Connection Communities, this team of people that do so well in making sure that our sections 
are well cared for and there's opportunity for there. Or, or maybe, maybe you're just you're thinking, man, maybe I'd like to do technology or, or something else that you just you look around and you think, man, I'd, I'd like to maybe give that a try. Just write that on the card. And the one thing we'd encourage you to do in these next few moments is just take a look at this card and begin to think, maybe some areas that I can just get some information on would be helpful. That'd be a first start. Just fill that out right now. Begin to fill that out. And uh, then in a few moments, as the bucket's being passed, drop on the, bu- drop on the bucket, and we'll make sure that we get that to you as well. But the fact is that the other area that, that, has been, that, is, that is a gift to you is the gifts that you've been trusted with. It's the gifts that you've been entrusted with. Who likes receiving a great gift? Anybody ever like receiving a great gift? You do? Yeah, I know you do. Yeah. It's your gift, but it's not your gift. You've got to pass the gift. So just start passing the gift. Sorry, it's not your gift. It's not your gift. Keep passing the gift. And, and the fact is that you've all been entrusted with a gift. As a matter of fact, just a little line for you here as these gifts go. You can actually say this. You can say that I am a gift. I am gifted as a gift to others. Say that with me. I am gifted as a gift to others. Or better yet, you can say this. I am God's gift to you. Go ahead. You can say that. <laughs> say that the first, to the person next to you right now. Just tell them, I am God's gift to you. You know, maybe you don't know the person next to you and you want to know the person next to you and this is an opportunity, guys. I'm telling you, it's a chance for you to tell her that you're God's gift to her and she may not believe that, but it's your opportunity. But we've all been given gifts. Romans 12, 6 says that we have different gifts according to grace given to us and, and, uh, and 2 Timothy 1, 6 says that when you, when you begin to hone in on those gifts, the one thing you've got to do is you've got to fan that flame of that gift. He says, for this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. He's saying, use that gift. Fan the flame of that gift. Begin using that gift. And when you do, you find it to be incredibly fulfilling. Here's Andy's story, and this is how he's finding his gift to be tremendously fulfilling. Uh, my name is Andy Rice. My wife and I serve in Impulse. Really, it's the highlight of our week. I think it's important within the body of Christ to use talents that God has blessed you with. and. Um, God has blessed me with the talent to work with with students and I think it's important for each person to find their niche in within the body to to serve and um, really um, as I serve these middle school students it, um, I go into it trying to impact them and really the impact uh, they impact me um, through stories that we share together and in times that we get to sit alone and talk about issues in their life it, it really um, it really impacts me on a deep level and uh, really they're ministering to me as well. So, I mean, that's the importance for me is just serving, being, being involved and um, just, just having an impact and sharing the love of God uh, wherever we go and to whomever we meet. Fanning the flame of the gift. First Peter 2.9 says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. You know what he's saying? He's saying three things. He's saying, first of all, I'm a priest. He's saying, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, and I was made for this. For some of you, when you walk into your workplace on a regular basis, you can walk in, actually, we'll talk about this next week, you can actually walk into your workplace saying, I'm a priest, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, and I was made for this. For some of you, when, when you find your place within serving within the context of a local body, you realize not only was I made for what I do 40 hours a week or however long that takes you, but when you walk in, in, into a place of being a part of a church community and saying, I want to I be a part of this deal, I want to continue to see what God is going to do here and how God's going to reach others, you can walk in saying, you know, I've got a place. I'm a priest. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, and I was made for this. You say, I've got the gift of mercy, and I, 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 I want to I actually... Do I want to actually go where people are hurting and come alongside of them and just show that gift of mercy and I'm going to serve in the care department of this church because I'm a priest, I'm a follower of Jesus and I was made for this. I love kids and I love teaching kids and I love being with kids and when you walk into a kid's city deal and you're able to sit down with kids and just engage with them relationally, you, you walk away going, I'm a priest, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ and man, I was made for this. When you're someone who's behind the scenes and, and you really don't want to be out front, but you want to be behind the scenes and, and you want to help unload trucks or you want to help be part of cleaning things up. And, and as you do that, you, you realize, wait, I'm a priest. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. And you find a sense of fulfillment in doing that. And you realize, I was made for this. I was made for this. That maybe, maybe you have that gift of giving. And, and because you have that gift of giving, you, you, every time you give, there's something in you that goes, ah, this feels so good to give. I'm a priest. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. And when you give, you say, I was made for this. I was made for this. And we're so, so thankful that you are. 
you know? For some of you, man, it's technology that makes it turn for me. Well, when you use that, I'm a priest, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, and I was made for this. I mean, you've been made for something. Find it and do it. And then Paul says this, and then I'm done. He says, and we have one mission, one mission. Look at what he says, verses 13 on. He says, until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. For him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. He's saying, we've got one mission. And the mission is to show humility and gentleness and patience and love and to realize that we don't, we're not called to do this alone, but as we all work together, as we all encourage each other, we all build one another up. And not only do we all build one another up, but we, we begin to grow into a wonderful picture of what God longs the church to be, a picture of a unified body unleashing its potential for the sake of reaching others for the cause of Christ. You with me on that this morning? Man, I hope that you are this morning. And I just want you to think about that as you keep passing that gift. And we're going to take an offering here as well. So um, let's pray together. Lord, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. Thank you, Lord, for, uh, for the truth of your word that calls us to a place of oneness. And now, Lord, as we, as we sing together, as we celebrate with each other, as we give to what you've called us to give to, uh, Lord, I pray that you would use it to, uh, to do great and mighty things uh, for the work that you've called us to do here in this city. We love you. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. every song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you Jesus the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Would you guys stand and sing? Holy. And holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes. all the praise we could ever pray worthy of every breath we could ever
Amen. I'm going to have you take a seat real quick. We're going to close things here for these next few moments. And if you are visiting with us this weekend, we want you to know this is not a normal thing that we do. But we're going to end today with something kind of unique to really what Ron has been talking about and, and uh, what, we've, what we've been um, doing together this morning. But I know that Ron started passing a gift earlier in this service. And I need to know where that gift is. Who has that gift? Let's see, where is it? Oh, it's all the way back here. All right. That is your gift. You get to hang on to that gift. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put you on the, on the spot for just a second. I'm going to have you stand up, uh, if you would. <laughs> now, what is your name? And you're going to have to say it loud so I can hear you. Mark. All right, let's congratulate Mark and encourage him because he has just received a gift. Now, Mark, we're all dying to know what's inside that box. So this is your moment to just rip that box open so we can all see the gift inside of it. This is kind of like your birthday, right? Except you've got 900 people at your party watching you open this gift. Nothing like being in the spotlight here. So okay, he's got it open. I think so. Okay, we've got, it's, it's a white box underneath that blue wrapping. Give, kind of giving you a play-by-play -play in case you can't see it. Um, all right. What's inside there, Mark? Now say that again. A couple hundred grand. He's talking about candy bars. So... I was, I was rattled a little bit there for a second. Um, so there's some candy in there, but what else is in there? Cash. How much cash? $200. $200. That is legit, okay? That is a real gift. All right, Mark, here's the deal. That is Pathways' gift to you, all right? You have just received that gift. Now, there's no strings attached to this, but there's a subtle twist, okay, because you now have the opportunity to use that gift in a way that, that, we, that God might put before you, an opportunity that God might put before you to really use that gift, right? And so um, you can have a seat. I don't want to put you on the spot any longer than you have to be. But, uh, but here's the deal, Mark. What we would love to do is follow up with you here in just a couple of weeks, and we'd love to hear from you how you use that gift. Would you be okay with that? Okay. You have, you have to say yes, right? I mean, everybody's watching and everybody's listening. All, yeah, okay, yeah. Awesome. So if you would, please, before you leave, just stop by guest services. They're ready for you over there. They want to capture your, your contact and, and all your information there uh, so we can reach back with you. And just hear how, because what we want to do here in a few weeks, at the end of this series, we actually want to share the stories of how God used the gifts that were given in each of these services. And so we're really excited. Now, there's no rules to this. Um, you can just really use it however God puts on your heart to do that. You don't have to do it alone. You can actually bring others alongside you, uh, with you if you'd like, and, uh, and we're excited to see what, what happens with that. All right? Let's, uh, let's just thank and congratulate Mark again. Now, here's, here's the deal, and this is kind of how we're bringing this all to a close together. All of us have received a gift, right? We've all been gifted, as Ron was, was teaching us earlier. We've all been gifted, and all of us really have to answer this question for ourselves. What are we going to do with those gifts? What are we going to do with those gifts? And in fact, someday we're going to have to stand before God and give account for that. God is just simply going to ask us, what did you do with all the gifts that I gave you and the opportunities that I put before you? And so we all wrestle with that. What are we going to do with these gifts? Because God wants to unleash the gifts that he has put within us. He wants to unleash them for his glory. He wants to unleash them for his church, for his kingdom. And so we're, we're all in that together. As Ron said, the big idea behind all of this we've been talking about today is that the power, the influence of a church is unleashed when God's people and the gifts that he has put within them are working together as one, right? So why don't you stand with me? We're going to pray, uh, we're going to pray our way out of here today, and I've got a couple of things that I want to, want to run by you before you walk out so nobody rush, but let's just close uh, in a word of prayer uh, together this morning. Father, thank you so much for the word that you have given us. Father, thank you for the challenge that we have to just understand, Father, first, uh, that we have been gifted. We've received a gift from you. And, Lord, that gift, that gift in us, Father, your gift in us is really your gift to the world around us. And, Father, you, we know that you want to see those gifts unleashed 
for your glory and for your church. So Father, give us the courage and the strength to walk boldly and obediently in step with you. Father, give us the courage to, to, to do that today and every day that follows. Lord, we love you so much. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, before you leave, as Ron mentioned earlier, this space is going to be transformed over these next few minutes into a garage sale space. Our garage sale load-in team is going to begin uh, bringing all these donated items in. So we need a little bit of help from you before you leave in just helping to stack these chairs. So if you'd be so kind as to uh, stick around just long enough to help us with that, that would be great. And if you did sign up to be a part of that load-in team, well, they're, I think they're asking for you to kind of uh, rendezvous in the cafe area, and they'll give you some marching orders over there. Other than that, you guys are free to go, and we'll see you all next week.